Director's dropping. Get the crash cart. I don't think it's gonna make it. Hey, Dr. X, get him to the OR. Just don't worry. Hang in there. We'll fix you right up. Maybe there's Peggy in here. And get that suit who's responsible. It's time for YC Reports with a special bulletin. Now, here's Gwen. In our search for information, we find there's a truckload of it readily available at our fingertips. There's a newspaper that's delivered to our doorstep or email or podcast that can ride around in our back pocket and the global mesh of data that we know as the Internet. This mountain of information comes to us raw and unfiltered, and while we're evaluating all this information, it's also important to acknowledge when we use them as sources. Today we explore what happens when people plagiarize or borrow material without giving credit to the source. The Daily Standard ran an exclusive article with allegations that famous historian Stephen Ambrose had copied passages in his book, The Wild Blue, from the work of a lesser-known author, Thomas Childers. And in 2006, USA Today reported that books were pulled from the shelves of bookstores and a half million dollar contract was canceled after first time author Kavya Viswanathan admitted to borrowing material from another author's work. And the New York Times shocked the nation when they uncovered one of their own reporters, Jason Blair, was fabricating quotes in his headline grabbing stories. I recently spoke with Mr. Teacher about some of the consequences of plagiarizing. Plagiarism affects us all, even beyond the world of academia. It's important to understand that to plagiarize, anytime you use someone else's ideas and don't give them proper credit. Why, you have showed us that historians have lost their reputations, authors their public, and reporters their livelihood. Here at Yavapai College, it's our job to make students aware of what plagiarism is and isn't, and to give them the tools to avoid it. Now Yavapai College defines plagiarism as submitting any academic work which is not entirely the work of the student, deliberately or accidentally. This can include, but is not limited to, such practices as not giving proper credit to a source, expanding someone else's work without proper credit, adopting another's work as one's own, including the copying of print or electronic media, directly using someone else's ideas without giving proper credit, and deliberately changing selective words to misrepresent someone else's work as one's own. Mr. Teacher, thank you for sharing this valuable information. This is Gwen reporting. Hey, Ima, wasn't that your teacher, Mr. Teacher? Yeah, I think so. Yes? My name is Mr. P. This is my associate, Mr. Q. What? Am I supposed to mind my P's and Q's? Are you I'm a trying? And did you write the research paper, The History of Velcro? Yeah, that's my paper. You have it? Come with us if you want your paper to live. We have a victim, four pages long, about a thousand words, and it's in bad shape. Yeah. Has citations, hemorrhaging everywhere, red ring burns over 60% of its body. There's a broken compound quote. How are the citations? I can barely find them. Who could have done such a thing? That's not our issue. Our concern is keeping this paper alive. Scalpel! No! Oh, okay, hon, calm down. Calm down, calm down. Your paper's gonna be all right, but it's time that you got involved. But I thought it was perfect. It's all right, dear. It's not the plague. It's just plagiarism. And the good news is it's all treatable. All right, you're new to this, so we're going to teach you some techniques to fix the injuries on that paper. And that way, you'll have the techniques to avoid the plagiarism clinic. But beware that not knowing is not an acceptable excuse. Now go with these fine gentlemen. They're going to give you some pointers before we scrub up. Let's have a little talk about your citations. I did them. What's the problem? Your citations are a wreck. Do you even have a clue about citations? 
Okay, let's start from the top. Good research is always documented, and researchers cite sources using a common citation style for their field of study. This is so they can share resources more easily, give credit to other people's works, and direct readers to the original source for further exploration. When you're asked to do research, you'll be expected to do the same. Just as punctuation helps an author to clearly communicate to their audience, citation styles help researchers share their resources in an accepted format. Two of the most common styles used at Yavapai College are MLA and APA. Your instructors may require another style, so be sure to check with them. Mr. Q, tell her about MLA. MLA style was created and maintained by the Modern Language Association and has become the standard for humanities and English courses. For example, if you research scholarly journals on how women are viewed by Shakespeare, you'll find articles that use the MLA style. How are women viewed by Shakespeare? Okay, Mr. Q, now view APA. The APA style, designed by the American Psychological Association, is most often used in courses such as psychology and sociology and some of your science classes. For example, for instance, if you explore the symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome, you will find professional journal articles using the APA style. The styles are very similar, however, APA emphasizes the publication year of the sources. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't think I use the right style in my paper. Okay, I know what to do now. Give me my paper. Okay, dear, you're not exactly quote ready. Uh, one way to include information and ideas from an outside source is to use quotes around the original material. Quotations can be a major source of support for your ideas. Using too many direct quotations, you can lose your own voice. Remember, you're writing the paper, Ima, not someone else. Use quotes that are particularly vivid, reinforce your main idea, contain controversial viewpoints, or that can't be paraphrased or summarized without changing the original meaning. This way. Here, hon, read this. This style guide will show you how to format any type of source. Quotations are identified by using quotation marks at the beginning and end of the source material followed by the in-text citation. Sometimes a quote is too long and you want to omit certain words or phrases. You can omit some of the quote as long as you keep the original meaning. Use an ellipsis to show where you left words out. Longer quotations require a special procedure known as block quoting. Block quotes do not require the usual quotation marks. Instead, you will indent the entire thing from the left margin. Define longer quotations. It depends on which citation style you're using. If the patient is MLA, any quote longer than four typed lines will use the MLA block quote procedure. But if it's APA, then use a block quote on anything longer than 40 words. Here, this book will show you how to do it. This area is still infected and needs major treatment. Why is that? Ah, uh, yes. Summarizing. In summary, summarizing encapsulates extensive essentials of source material you have discovered during your research. You may find that several paragraphs or even a whole chapter proves elucidating on the subject of your research. Like a roiling stew of ideas. Boiled down to the most basic and tasty parts. <laughs>
The most important factor for a good summary is that you never lose sight of the author's original intent and meaning. But how do I do that? How long is a summary? First, you must fully understand the passage before you try to condense it into a shorter form. A summary may be as short as a single sentence or as long as several paragraphs, depending on the purpose of the summary and the amount of detail you want to highlight. I bet you want an in-text citation in there too. Of course. Whenever you use someone else's words or ideas, you have to cite your original source. For example, if you are doing a summary paragraph, you could introduce the author in the first sentence and put your citation at the end of the last sentence of the paragraph. Okay, I can do that. Oh, hi, I'm Gwen from YC News. I'm doing a special report on plagiarism, and I heard there was an emergency here. Are you involved? I'm afraid so. Well, I'd like an hour of your time. It'll only take a minute. I'd like a student's perspective on plagiarism. What's your name? My name's Ima Tryant, but I only have a few minutes. I have to get back to the OR. Well, can you tell us what you know about avoiding plagiarism? Well, I now know that you want to use a direct quote for emphasis and to reinforce your point. But when you use too many direct quotes, it looks like you haven't done much of your own analysis. I also learned how to condense a large amount of information by summarizing. And whether you're using a direct quote or summarizing, it's important to include that in-text citation. Well, that's it. I gotta get in there now. So, you think you've learned something, have you? Well, come over here and tell us something about paraphrasing. Paraphrasing? No one told me about that. Throughout your research, you will surely find interesting things to include in your paper. But one way to avoid using too many direct quotes is by employing the time-honored technique of paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is when you put another author's words and style into your own. Like summarizing, you must first fully understand what the author was trying to express. But you can't include any of their unique language from that quote. Instead, you have to put it into your own words and style. But unlike summarizing, you're not trying to condense the passage. Instead, your paraphrase should be just about as long as that original passage. And I bet you there's an in-text citation in there too, huh? Oh, yes there is. <laughs> Hey, what's the big deal about in-text citations anyway? Well, without them, you're plagiarizing. You're essentially stealing someone else's ideas. Even when you use something like an image, map, or chart, you need to cite it. By using an in-text citation, you give credit to the original author. You also show evidence that you researched a topic and brought outside support to your ideas. The in-text citation is usually found at the end of a quote, paraphrase, or summary. What if it's something I already know, like George Washington was the first U.S. president? Well-known facts are called common knowledge. Since we all know Washington was our first president, you wouldn't need to cite that. But not everyone knows he started losing his teeth in his early 20s. So you would need to cite that. Always be careful when dealing with common knowledge. What may be well-known to you in your interest or field of study may not be common knowledge to your readers. When in doubt, Cite. Are you getting this? Whenever you include an in-text citation, you also have to list that source at the end of your paper. The two go hand in hand. And if you forget to provide that list, guess what? You're plagiarizing. When using the APA style, this list is called a references page. For MLA style, it's a works cited page. This list shows you where you found your information so that anyone can look up your sources for themselves. Hopefully, you kept track of all the sources you found so you don't have to go back and find them again. 
Mr. Q, now it's your turn. APA and MLA are just two of the many different style formats. Always check with your instructor to verify which style to use. Yavapai College Library has many style guides to help you format correctly. You can use one of their online tools like Citation Machine, but only as a guide. They're not always accurate, so double check your results with a style guide. And cut! That's a wrap. One last thing, Ima. We've only covered the basics of citing sources today. There's many kinds of sources that you can use and many ways to format them. Bottom line is, it's up to you to use the tools we've given you to get it right. Finally! I can go fix the rest of my paper!